training, they get the training, and they get the super fit, and you see these same guys finish in the same position every race, no matter how strong they look. And they never seem to break through. Because what they are concentrating on is, is pure brute force and not technique. Technique takes you like this. The Roger Federer's of this world, no matter how old he gets, he seems to be doing well. That's why I watched a 54-year-old can keep up with the youngsters. Not because I train as hard as them, not just because I drink as little wine as them and have as little fun as them. Because I have fun and I enjoy it. That's why you're here to learn how to go fast without as much effort. <coughs> because so many people do this, in fact, Sean Rice knows this guy, Bruce Wenka his name is. He does this and before one World Marathon Champs in Denmark, he said, listen Oscar, I'm training twice a day now because I really think I'm going to go fast and I'm going slower. What? You have to see him paddle to realize what's going on. He just gets worse and worse and worse. <laughs> he, he practices shit technique better. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he gets slower. <laughs> so, and again, most people don't even know how the tools of the trade work. Most people don't even know. Because why was this wing paddle invented? Why was it invented? What is the reason it got invented? The reason why it got invented to use your big muscles. Your big muscles. Because what happened, the Swedish national coach was coaching um, the Swedish national team and he, and he actually happened to meet a guy from Saab, Sweden. They used to make aeroplanes and cars. They failed in the car department, but the aeroplane was still great. And he said, oh, all my paddlers, because we used to paddle like this and like this and like this. And you see Gerd Fredrickson from Sweden paddling like this and this. And he said, no, my paddlers are paddling like this. And guess what her, What this does is courage using my legs. What this does, no legs. So it was this, this aerospace engineer said, no, no, we can make a paddle that can actually work for you. So you can actually use your legs and use the force of your legs into a padding stroke. And that's why the wing paddle came. Basically, same as a wing. You go along there, you get upward lift. Okay. So it goes along, it goes upward lift, and it does the same here. We put it in. Your actual part, your, if you paddle is done well, goes in, it actually goes forward like this and pulls you forward. By the way, the paddle never just comes back and you don't go forward. That's what a lot of people do. They put it in and they pull the paddle halfway back and you go halfway forward as opposed to going there and the paddle pulling you forward, pulling us forward. Okay, so the wing paddle was developed exactly the same as you do in rowing. Rowing, rowing is like this, there and what am I using? Legs, the only difference between rowers and paddlers. We use one leg and there rowing. And us there, exactly the same movement, except they back, I mean they row back. And some people are actually doing that sport nowadays, rowing back. But it, the reason why they got those sliding seats is they're using their legs. What is the strongest muscle in your body? Your leg. So what you're gonna learn today is that we're gonna I don't want you to believe anything I say. Because if you just believe all I tell you, you won't understand it. Because my objective is when you believe here, you keep on improving. And the only way you're going to keep on improving is by understanding what I'm telling you. Because if somebody else comes to you and says, Oh, no, I've got this much knowledge. I was planning two weeks longer than you. I've been told to do this and this. And you'll say, Okay, that makes sense. Because you haven't even thought about it. Perfect example, we hold our paddle where? Where do we hold our paddle? On the shaft, is correct, it's not a good question. Okay, but where on the shaft? What have you been told? Why 90 degrees? Ah, that's sort of right. But the most important reason why you hold it at 90 degrees, you haven't even worked out, and nobody actually works. Number one, it's natural. The first push up you ever learned, the first pull up at 90 degrees first bench press, but the most important reason, the most important reason, <coughs> seems unstable. Okay, the most important reason, I hold it, why don't I hold it this wide, look how nice this looks, watch where my paddle touches the boat, look at this, look how good this is, as opposed to 90 degrees, I do the same thing, jeez, that can't be right, I think it's changed that. Look how far I can go if I go. You must have seen the guys. After a long paddle, everybody's paddles here and they think they're doing so well. Haven't you seen that? 
How many people's pedals sliding? No, none of you. I'm yeah. very surprised. <laughs> I'm just too shy to admit. Okay, this is the reason why I hold it at 90 degrees. To get to the same place, I have to do this. To get to the same place, I have to rotate. Okay, so it forces you to rotate. So that's the reason why I hold, hold it at 90 degrees. So some people always say, no, I find I get more leverage as I move in. The only thing that happens is that you're using less body and it feels harder to do. Okay. Okay, so now we've established the wing panels there to use your big muscles, legs and core. The next thing in any paddle sport that we do, that is SUP, Outrigger, Dragon Boat, any paddle sport, there's one common denominator that this blade must never go past vertical. There. Not one millimeter past. The moment it goes past vertical, where's my power going to? In the air, and I'm pulling myself into the water. Don't care what happens, that's exactly happened. That's why most of you don't even realize it. All paddles are bent down like this. Notice it's bent down. The reason why it's bent down is so it doesn't go past vertical. So your shaft can go past vertical, but my paddle hasn't gone past vertical. That's why in an SUP it's bent further back and an OC1 is slightly less back. Okay, but at the end of the day it's bent back so it doesn't go past vertical. Perfect analogy, and you saw those, uh, those rescue boats, they've got outboard engines, and for them to go along <coughs> the shallows they tilt their engine up. But the funny thing, as you tilt it up, those boats don't go fast. In fact, they hardly can keep up, because once they tilt that engine up, even though they've got 200 horsepower, the, engine, the water sprays in the air, in fact, if anybody been in a duck where you tilt the engine up, the duck goes like this and the water sprays out there and you don't go forward. And that's what 95% of the people do. The reason why they do that is three things that cause that problem and very easy to fix if you know. The first thing is, we go to the gym, they have a version active, one look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, so they do the pulls and pull and get strong, big muscles. They go like that and they pull with their arm. Two things I'm doing wrong. My arm, as we established, is not as strong as my leg, so I put it in and I pull with my arm and every millimeter I pull with my arm, this blade goes past vertical faster and faster. There and there. So I've used my arm, which is weak, and I'm pulling it past vertical. So basically what I want to do is we want to just rotate, and again, what I'm trying to teach is natural. So if I rotate, notice my hips move. Now my hip, if my leg's locked, this happens, and I am not in this position. Now what I want to do is all I want to do is drive my leg into my hip and pull back. And funny enough, I've got an exercise we could do. But you guys will see with my nice Pulling there. If I get people to do this exercise, the first thing I ask Biscuit, if I ask him to do it even right now, he will do this. Okay, come on. Okay, come on. No, no, yeah, come on. Because most people, the small muscles always try and take over. They always try and take over. So this happens to understand. This is the power straight. You can see from there and there. So no stress on your shoulder. Nothing at all. From there to there. And that's how long this paddle stroke is. Remember, we're not paddling, pulling the blade back. We're making our boat go forward. So when people say, oh, that's such a short stroke. <laughs> but if my paddles are locked here and I'm just going past it, I want it very short. It should be this short. But I must get the boat to go a long way. Okay, that's number one. Number two, and it's the hardest thing because the coaches around the world, some of them have got it confused. Or you interpret what they're telling you wrong. And they tell you, push the top hand, punch the ocean, punch the opposition. Correct? What do they tell you? This is, and look what happens. I do this. I get in the boat and I've been told by the, uh, the coach, push the top hand. What is happening here? The, I haven't even taken a stroke, but the strongest part, the small muscle takes over and, and then I spend my rest of my time past vertical. Have a look again, there and there. Two things wrong. Number one, I'm using my hand and my arms. And number two, this is going past vertical at a rapid rate. So how do we sort that situation? Very simple. Hey? Oh, you, you still didn't get it right. Then. No, no, you didn't get it right. Little finger up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Go.
Okay, so what you're going to learn today is this is the default position. Default position is that your shaft stays parallel to your chest at all times. Now have a look. I'm going to try and make this blade go forward without using my arms and for this young lady, her shoulders. Watch this. Has the blade gone forward? It's not a trick question. Has the blade gone forward? Yes. yes. Have I used any arms? Whatsoever. Guess what I've got used? This is what's pushing it forward and this is what's pulling it back. So some, some, and in fact I did this video about 19 years ago. What percentages push and pull? Now, if you've got every stroke, you've got a hundred percent of your body working. So just think about this. I'm pushing with this side using my core muscles. I am pulling with the side using my core muscles. So you my whole body for every stroke. There's no left and right hand side. Okay. So look what happens. So this is how we're gonna go there and there, as opposed to there and there. See the difference? This is arm. body and not past vertical. Okay. Third thing that causes your paddle to go past vertical is dropping your top hand. So what happens we get to here and we just drop our top hand and look what happens to the back of my blade. If I drop my top hand my blade goes past vertical. But actually it's cause and effect. The cause is if I pull too far back the paddle gets stuck in the water and it pulls my hand down. But you have to focus on something like a 10,000. If I keep my hand up, the paddle has to come out. If I keep my hand going down, the paddle will go down with you. Yeah, and make you go past it. So those three things alone. And in the ocean, it's even more important because the faster you go, the more you pull back down a run, and the more you pull back down the run, the more it's pulling you out of the boat. Okay, because when I'm here, I'm putting the brakes on. Whether I like it or not, the paddle's pulling the brakes on, and it can take you out. So it's very important not to go past vertical. Okay, now we've got that part, we've got to make sure we understand all the basics and undo what we've learned in the past because like most people, most people are like sheep. So they just follow what somebody else told them and it just gets passed on. And we're going to try and sort of spell some of those. The first myth is which feather angle do you use? You know what a feather angle? You turn like this. Which feather angle do you guys use? How many use right 60 degrees? Mm. Ah, this is part of the sheep. Okay. <laughs> Why do you use right 60 degrees? <laughs> Comfortable, okay. <laughs> Somebody told me to. Yeah, it's written in the books. <laughs> hey? Okay, so let me explain to you. Okay, why was it the feather angle even introduced? Paddle sports started 3,000 years ago, by the way, by the Inuit Indians. Have you seen those stupid paddles? They are ridiculous. They're this thick, two little flat planks, and they've got no feather angle. They've got no wind resistance until they call it Euro braids or flat blades, which most people know, are bigger blades. And the reason why you've got a feather angle is so you can cut through the wind. That's why when I started paddling, you had 90 degrees, left or right. I'm left feather. Why am I left feather and you're right feather? Because I'm not a sheep. Okay, that goes for granted. But why am I left feather? No, because I'm not left handed. Because my father was left feather. <laughs> and my father taught me he left feather. And his club that he was at was left feather. And that's why anybody my father taught is left feather. And it's funny enough, in Oslo, in Norway, everybody is left feather. So when I say this, they're all left feather. And Sweden no. next door, where the wind came from, they were right feather. Pan, no sense. And Denmark, where the problem came, the guy from Denmark was left feather who went to Oslo. They are left and right feather. But again, right feather. Okay, so now we've established that the reason for the feather angle is for the wind, going into the wind. Now, now we've got a thing called a wing paddle. Do you think this goes through the wind or right? What is the name of this thing? actually goes through the wind very easily. Okay. And what are we trying to do anyway is do downwind cutting. Why do we need to cut through the wind <laughs> with a feather angle? Because I can tell you right now, all you people, 
right feather. I'm going to put this thing on right feather. I'm going to explain the situation, especially your ski pad. Right 60. They all sit like this, perfect. The wave hits them with this side and it's over they go. How many people fall out on the right hand side? Yes. So don't be shy. Most people fall out on the right hand side. And how many can remount on the right hand side? Put your hands up. Yeah. Exact. Most people fall on the left hand side, uh, right hand side and can only remount on the left hand side. Because this thing called a feather angle, look there and there. So when I go for my brace, there's something there that's not there. So when I teach people now, I teach them with no feather angle. No feather angle. So those people that are supposed to, there's those Dubai guys, the one guy's going to teach, want to learn how to teach. When I teach people now, it's zero angle. The reason why we think we hit like left and we think we like right feather is because somebody told you before. I can tell you, all you have to do is get a new person paddling, and anybody gets a new person, you put them in the boat like this, and they go, they don't think you don't have to, you don't have to tell them anything. And when they brace, they're like, oh, see, this is so easy. But you get like the other sheep, and you put them, oh, no, no, you know. See, you're new to paddling, they go 60 right. And then you go, watch the blade. And then you see them, okay, there, and there, and, and they spend their life like this, and they don't actually go anywhere, believe you me. I take somebody with zero, zero uh, degree feather and they improve so fast it's funny. Now, when you've got a feather and you start getting uh, wrist problems and things like that, just reduce your feather so you cannot change your feather once you've got it in unless you reduce it slowly. So don't believe that, say, oh, zero degree, fantastic. No, it's not. You've got no chance of changing if you've been paddling a long time. You've got it because it becomes, it becomes second nature. Just like I say, it feels comfortable. The only reason why it feels comfortable is because everybody else does it. But if you start it again, and, and I was at 90 left, now I'm on 70, and, and every year I'll just reduce by five, or, and, and I'll be down to zero. Why have sore wrists, and why worry about bracing, and you can brace like that? But for me, it's natural to brace like this. And the Sersky paddling, the biggest cause of people being bad at Sersky paddling is they don't brace well enough, so they don't get the confidence, and they won't go out there, but if you can a bump, bump proof brace, you'll never, ever fall out. So the guys that you teach now... That, I always do zero. Zero. <coughs> zero. And if they want to change, it's only... Uh, interesting fact now... Like if, you're, if you're at zero, do you have to actually just get your leg... No. Right? No, it just goes. When you do it, it's zero. It just goes like this. You don't even think about it. It's the most amazing. We are so tuned into it. It's funny. Because the angle of the blade, you don't have no, you don't. You do nothing. You do, you do absolutely nothing. It just it becomes. It's so stupid how we've been in tune. And the only way you see, and you can't do it yourself because we are so in tune. I'm like this, or this, you know. And you can't do it yourself unless you give two new guys. It's a classic. You give one guy a feather, and the other guy. It's like a joke. The other guy's panting and having fun. The other guy's still trying to work out the paddle, and then he forgets, and the guy's falling out. The other guy's bracing and doing everything naturally because we are so in tune. It's the most amazing. And I've, I've worked on it, worked on this. Oh no, the higher you pedal, the more you, it's because you're holding on. If you don't hold on, it goes absolutely fine. This is on zero now. But again, if you've been paddling a long time, you can't change. You've got to do it in the slow thing. So you don't have to cock the wrist to actually get it in. <coughs> no, no, it just goes in. But again, you, it's better to, you, it's for you to do it. It's harder to, you can't believe it. Because so you don't understand how in tune you are from doing this for 20 or 30 or 100,000 hours. So, so what if you've been paddling a long Then it goes zero. Just goes zero. zero. Just go, go back to zero. If okay. you, I just I bet, started. So. Yeah, but <coughs> if it feels funny, go back to zero. And you'll see, you'll okay. say, oh, no, I'm, I can brace. I can do everything. So but, the reason that we're all falling in the right side more often is because the right side brace is weaker. <coughs> right side wake is weak, weaker. And look at the look at the angle of your of your paddle. So the, it lies perfectly here. And when you go to brace on this side, it's like that. Yeah. Right, you have to turn. Yeah. So now if you zero angle, very angle, it sits like this, brace down, and you pull this out. Oh, see, I didn't fall out this side anymore. Okay, but don't change it unless you're happy with it. Next thing is, we all understand what feather means. So, understand why you've got your feather is because somebody told you to do that. Next one is paddle length. Paddle length is a nice mind feel for most people. The biggest and most important part of paddle length is that there's no specific paddle length for anybody. If you want to really get scientific about it, you have to find out how tall you are, how strong you are, 
how wide your boat is, how high your seat is, how far you're going to paddle, how fast you're going to paddle, what the technique is, high or low. All these factors come in to determine your paddle. Okay. But the funniest thing in 1999, Greg Barton invented the first adjustable paddle. He had a hose, this sort of a hose clamp like this to adjust. And also 1906 was the first ever Tour de France. I like to use cycling quite often because in the Tour de France in 1906 you would have seen guys were, um, they always had the tie around their neck, they wore a cap, no head protection, and they used to run in the cafes in, in the chateaus right high in the mountain, you sip a wine and normally a smoke which was good for your lung. Now the only vitamin S they use is a bit stronger than smoke. But they took a smoke and then they kept on pushing up the hill which was like so steep it was unbearable in 1906. Why do you think they pushed up the hill? Uh, huh? One gear. One gear, exactly. Exactly. Who owns bicycles here? How many have you got no gears? <laughs> One, two, what do you live in? Uh, Dubai or something? Flat. Do you think it's fun paddling up, uh, paddling up Alpe d'Huez with one gear? Could you be? Yeah, okay, that's the other way you could do it. Okay, so the difference is there's no difference between paddling and cycling. This thing here, by the way, is a mechanical tool like your bicycle. A mechanical tool is something that enhances your body without with being a mechanical part. And this is a mechanical part when I last check. If you ha don't have this, you're doing another sport called swimming or another sport. Okay, so this is a mechanical tool and we should use it as such. So do you think you go the same speed against the wind as with the wind? No. Why would you wear, have the same paddling. Why would you have the same paddling? Do you feel the same every single day you wake up and oh, I'm top of the morning, they told me 2.20, I'm going and I'm easy. You gave me too many beers, I can't pull this paddle, but I'll just grin and bear it. Or I'll have 50 different strokes as opposed to a cyclist there's one cadence, changes gears and learns one cadence and one cadence. The reason why you guys don't change your paddle length is because you're too worried when you do your brace, you fall out. And then you also lose a lot of time. But if you practice this, I can tell you something. It's, it's a game changer. In the Molokai, for all those years when, when I started, I used to have to do this. In 25 knot wind, that's when the wind blew in Molokai, by the way. 25 knot wind like this, close it, and every Molokai I finished from that on having these just will paddle the 210. So you'll see my, I hold my hands right out here. Because my hold, my shaft, always at 210. So 90 degrees is about there. I don't care because I'm just holding on there. Okay. So the most important thing is to practice. Even today when I came around that bend, today, anybody paddle on the outside, the wind was howling against us. First thing I did, shorten my paddle by four centimeters. You think it makes a difference? Try it. Don't believe me again. Don't believe me. Just try it. But it makes a huge difference. Molokai is a perfect example. You're going 18, 20 kilometers away the whole time. For again, 52 kilometers is quite a long way. So unlike most people, I do get tired. Every hour, I normally reduce about two centimeters. But the last bit, the last bit coming into Waikai, into the howling wind, I'll go down to the shortest I can. Even in this race here to, uh, on Saturday, whenever, halfway along, if I'm feeling tired, I'll reduce about two centimeters. Going along the back there, I'll probably reduce about another one, and then I know as I catch the wave coming into Umberland, I'm going to go to 210, 211 to make it manageable for me. Okay, any questions on that? <laughs> okay, don't believe me, go and try it for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Would you use Just a Same with the bicycle. Downhill, big gear, uphill, small gear. Going uphill, you want a higher cadence, so all you do is make your paddle short. So basically what happens, on a long paddle, you catch here, shorter, shorter, shorter down. The, everything else stays the same. Okay. Everything must stay the same because it's like you're cranked on your bicycle. Okay, That stays the same, but everything else, the gears change. I'll stay with the downwind position because... Um 
like a bit bigger like today and you're sort of raiding up and down a bit more, will you have it downwind longer or shorter? No, that was a yeah, downwind gonna be longer and again but uh, in the downwind yep. so difference. Another different teaching is that I teach completely different when it comes to downwind. Uh, my rating, I want to go slower when I catch the run and increase once I'm on the run. Because I don't know how and people do this, but they are a little bit younger and maybe not as clever yet. Is they <laughs> increase their rate to catch the run and now, they're, now you're actually going fast and now you have to increase your run rate even more. Where I make my rate go slower. It's like starting a sprint race is normally one two, three, slow, hard, powerful strokes as opposed to going <laughs> wheel spinning, which most people do. And then when you're on the wave, now you're going 20 k's now, you're still trying to get the cadence even higher. Impossible, I can't do it. But there's some people that can do it. So I want to be longer and stronger, okay? And then, so going back to the bicycle, these adjustments here are, is your back cog, right? And this adjustment is your front cog. Very simple, big front gear, Big blade, shorter paddle, if you're doing 200 meters, big here and big here, just like I said. Okay, no difference. Okay, no difference. But again, experiment. Sometimes, if you're feeling tired, <coughs> you can actually bring down your bring down your paddling so your cadence sort of stays the same. Because basically what happens, as you get tired, you can't pull the paddle through the water. This long paddle, you make it shorter and you, makes it easier to go through. Okay. But again, important to actually practice it before you try and do it. Otherwise, you'll end up like my friend Romalio, who <coughs> is a world marathon champion. I told him this trick. He didn't practice and he fell out and he blamed me. Yeah. So he can't brace. And he falls out quite often. You should, should take up surfing better. Okay, so now we're going to go... <coughs> Onto paddling, and the most important stroke in paddling is brace. Huh? Brace. Everybody knows the brace stroke is the most important. Okay, let's just ask. I was going to shoot. I want the answer. How many hours a day do you practice the brace stroke? Long <laughs> No, you don't. That, not under uh, not under duress and under stress. How many times a day do you practice the brace stroke? So we've, you all said what's the most important, you all know the brace stroke and we don't practice it. Why don't we practice it? Because we think we don't need it. It's like Tiger Woods, what's the easiest and the most important stroke in putting? I mean in golf, putting. You think they putt, you know what? They putt double amount of time than any other club in the bag. And what is the easiest to do? The brace stroke. What is the easiest to do in golf? Putting. Golfers spend more time putting than getting more. We all do exactly the opposite. We just like to paddle and paddle and practice our bad techniques. Okay, now why is the brace stroke so important? Let's get that so we're actually on the same page. Why is it so important? Stability, yes, that's number one. It's the most restful stroke. Look, I'm resting. I put my hand and you learn your hand goes on your knee, other hand here, hand open. Relaxing. I've got no pressure on my shoulders, nothing. I'm, rest, I'm resting and I'm resting both sides. It's very easy to do it on both sides, it's very easy to get good at it. Yeah. Another reason why we want it, it's very important, is also the start of the forward stroke. Because from here, very simple, up here, and I'm in default as we talked about earlier. Default is parallel, elbows down. Okay. And then we go into the forward stroke, which is basically eight, eight parts. Catch, power, exit, recovery, left hand, right hand. Side. Yeah, so it's very simple. <coughs> Default. So the reason why I've started, and I've been doing this for quite a long time, and funny enough, it's funny how it takes quite a lot of long time for sheep to divert, and a lot of the sprinters and everything. And now, in Spain, sure, they've even got mechanisms now drop people's elbow. They've got a brace that sits here so you can keep your elbow down. So they've finally seen the light. Taking them 15 years, 16 years. We've been coaching this forever. 
Because let me tell you, when you get start getting sore shoulders, you actually realize you can't have your elbows here unless you're 21 and getting physio every day, sleeping 20 hours a day, you know? That's what they do and train the rest. Okay, so defaults here, elbows down. Why are my elbows down? Let's give a few reasons. Lower center of gravity. Yeah, lower center of gravity, very good. First thing, your arms weigh 10% of your body weight, by the way. Bit of useless information, supplied by the medical council, Karen. Okay, next thing. It's a relaxed position. Very relaxed. If my elbows are down, I don't use my chickpeas. Okay, what else? And now this is the most important part. Do you think <coughs> Mark Tyson boxes like this? Does he box like this and this? Don't count as biting, but it's boxing there <laughs> and there. If your elbows are down, you engage your core. If you engage your core, you, you can read numerous amounts of books that tell you that your core and your hips are the, are the, are the sort of basis of every single sport. Golf, how do you play golf? Tennis, even rugby. Everything comes from your core. But as soon as you take it out here, you can do whatever your arms are doing and they're not connected to my legs. But when I drop my elbows and, and all the martial arts, they do it flat out, I'm engaging my core. Engaging my core. Okay, so that's the most important reason why you keep your elbows down. And you'll never get sore shoulders. People might have heard of Boyan, who's, who's Tarifa. He was a backstroke swimmer for the Bulgarian national team. It's like making a Tillywigs team in the Peru. Yeah? No, he's not bad. He was quite good. <laughs> but he he came to me, he was living in Dubai and he started paddling full time teaching. And he said, No, I've got to give up, I can't paddle anymore. I said, no, no, no. You've got to have a sore shoulder. You cannot have an excuse about shoulders we paddle from. Remember, I've been paddling for 45 years. And for 25 years, we're told this. This. Push this. And you can see, I can even feel how cranky it is. And if I do paddle badly, and sneak up here, you get shoulder infants. I've never had any operations that have been planning for a long time or many hours. No rest in between. So elbows down, no injuries, and I'm engaging my foot. Okay, the forward stroke, all very simple. This is how most people paddle, and I see it all the time. And out they go. This is the catch. Have you seen this before? Beautiful photographs of posters, and from here they go and they do the famous air stroke. It's in the paddles in the air, then it hits the water nicely here. We get a nice sore wrist normally, then a sore elbow, and then a sore shoulder, and I normally get a bit of splash here just to make it even feel better. And my paddles only get down. Yeah, famous air stroke and do all I like, and I'm not going to go forward. Air stroke, hit the water, all the various problems and I carry on doing my stroke and it comes further back because I've started too late. Okay, my catch is very simple. From here, rotate to keep my panel parallel with my chest, use gravity, shoot it in. Look at the difference, I'm shooting it in there, other people are shooting it in here, and they're getting half the paddle. I'm getting my whole paddle in at the start. So the catch is very important. The catch, closest to the boat as possible, okay? Closest to the boat as possible there. 90 degrees to the boat. Remember, watch here, this angle 90 degrees. I'm not really too phased about this angle. Same thing here, 90 degrees. Not this and helping the wing paddle along, and not this under your boat. So 90 degrees to the boat. And then, as I said, most people have paid full price for the paddle, use the whole blade, right up to here. Because most people, when they get it in that way, the airstroke, they go up here, the only time they use the full blade is the time that's useless from here to here. Okay. So going through the catch again, rotate nicely. Notice I didn't do this because this actually is the problem with that kind of catch. I'm doing the airstroke with no arm, with no leg, and then I go as opposed to this in. Now drive. What is the strongest part of my body? Legs. I drive my leg touch to the bottom and once my legs touch the bottom stroke is over have I gone past vertical so look at the other side there 
there. Have I gone past vertical? No, but I can easily do that. My coach told me to punch forward and then I'm going miles past vertical. Okay, so keeping it back there. Now phase, where have you been told to exit? At your hips. hips, yeah, yeah. All talk, talk shit again. <laughs> okay, so this is what happens to those people when they tell the exit, go along, e exit. I know I'm at my hips, I take it at my rudder. Most people, I can tell you right now, because your brain's not quick enough. When it gets to the hips, it comes out here. So I want you to start taking it out by your knees. Have a look. I rotate in power. I'm at my knee. Power off. Both are still going forward, guys, and all I do is lift my hand. I'm in default. But if I take it, now oh, I'm at my hip, and I'll take it out there. Too far back, then I have to use my elbow to get this paddle out, and then I have to splash my mates next to me, paddling it a K1. Make it more wet. So there, in, in past the toes. Knees finished, let the hand go, and up. So I'm trying to take it out before my hips, but I'm thinking knees. So you got a, you basically you got a two-part action, the turn and the drop. Yeah, first now, turn how, and how then drop. See me, how, me, how do you see me? It's, it's seamless. Look okay, if I do it properly, if I, as you get better, it just becomes seamless. That's why when you look in the video, it doesn't even look. Yeah. So it's like this. You can't tell I did that. No. So it's, it's there. There, it's one part. Understand? That's what confusing thing with videos. You think, oh no, he's doing that. Uh, I'll, I'll simulate that. It's not quite like that. But if you slow it down, there, 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 there. Okay, the exit. Hand only. Hands 5% of your body weight as opposed to 10%. Okay. So out. Exit. Recovery. Recovery. I'm not too phased. Again, I'm not, there's so many different goal swings, so many different techniques. There's always going to be one basic. But if you're using our core, we take it in, put it by our toes, take it out by our knees, and elbows down. And this heart must stay consistent. Consistent. So whether it's low or high, I'm not phased. It doesn't really make a big difference. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the heart just might get you a little bit more perpendicular, but it doesn't make a huge difference. In the surf paddling. Maybe on a 200 meter or a 500 meter, it can make a difference, but over 26 kilometers, I'm not really worried about that. It's not going to make a difference. Now, what happens with most coaches now? They say, oh, that's the easiest thing in the world. Us is giving me the new lease of life. Let's go and practice it. And all they do is they go out and practice. Unlike what every other sport that I've played, it's the golf, the tennis, the cricket, the water power, the swimming, they've all got drills. Believe me, you even go to swimming, you're going to ask Phelps. I think he's got like 60 drills that you can do. 60 drills. How many drills do you guys know? Except from the dentist. <laughs> okay. Nobody's got drills. So how do I take my little technique apart into small little parts so I can build it up to the right way? It's impossible. When you start playing golf, they say, here's the golf club. Here's the go and play your first round. That's what they do in badminton. They don't say, oh no, this is how you do it. You first learn to putt, you learn to chip, you do... No, no. You get in a boat and you paddle. In fact, the worst thing I see coaches, they never even teach anybody the brace stroke. How many people, when they've got in the boat, the first thing they said, hey, this is how you do the brace stroke. This is the most important thing. It's going to keep you afloat. No, no. Paddle. Oh, you fell over. Oh, no, come back. Try again. Who got taught the brace stroke their first time? The most important stroke, nobody even teaches you. And you, even the top sprinters, they come and paddle the surskis and they can't brace either. So, what I developed, because I was getting sick and tired of teaching people, and the next year they came back and they're still as shit as they were before. I thought I was a really bad teacher. But all it is, it's all about trying to break the stroke into small pieces that when you go away from this lesson, that you keep on improving little pieces at a time and just paddling around is not the way to do it it's breaking up into small parts and having drills for every part so what i've got is three catch drills and i've got every body part hand elbow shoulder core legs exit and then putting all together elbow to knee so all those parts you can work on them one stroke at a time and what i normally do and 
when I'm in uh, when I was living in South Africa training for the Molokka, I had a, a dam which is 450 meters long and 350 meters wide, and that's where I did most of my training, doing drills. My drills, obviously, they, they were a bit of exercise, but the difference was was concentrating, and in my drills, this brace stroke 50% of the time, or 45% of the time, I'm bracing. Yeah. And those drills, basically, I paddle do a drill for 450 meters, turn around, then pick a, a, a kilometer that I start at, speed, 8 kilometers for 150 meters, 10 kilometers for 150, and 12 kilometers for 150 meters. Trying to do the same cadence, and that's where I start my paddle at 220, the longest it goes. And then I go to shorter and longer and mess around with my paddling to see what works for me on that day. That's the way you can actually practice your paddling. So, there's a few tricks to doing drills. Number one, they must be on a stable boat. No use being in an unstable boat. Say, See, I'm struggling with this drill and I'm not even doing the drill. All I'm doing is balancing. Okay. Number two, when you're doing a drill, just do one drill at a time. Don't try and do 10 drills and I'm trying to work, I'm trying to do this catch drill and that drill. One drill at a time. Try and get that one right. When you've got that one right, put you to the next one and the next one and the next one. That's how you get it. So it's very important <coughs> to make sure that it's not a race. So when you're doing the cadence part, try and make your speed the same with the same cadence and all you do is increase the power of your paddle stroke and not increase the cadence. Okay. So going through the drill. <coughs> First drill is one hand catch. Very simple, you're not going to go forward. That's just to show the difference between hitting the water like this and just going straight in, you'll see this is like a joke. It just goes in like a knife, hot knife through butter. Next drill is two hand catch. I rotate first and I just drop it in, just keeping it parallel with my chest. The next drill in the first forward stroke drill, drill and I've got notes for all of you. pull 30, 30 centimeters. The reason why I want 30 centimeters is I want to take your stroke from what it's been, which is here to here, to there to there. So everything is trying to move the stroke forward. If you stroke forward, you're pushing down on the water and lifting yourself up, which gives you balance. Going past the vertical, you're creating problems and putting yourself in. So catch and pull, rotate, catch, pull. Out. One side of drill, but you're not bracing. Okay, body parts. Top hand, the most important drill out of all the drills I developed. You brace forward, you watch your top hand, and you don't watch the display. There, and you just keep it the same distance from your shoulder. Look what's happened to my body, by the way. And I'm watching, and I brace back. Pull, brace back, pull, brace back. Okay, as opposed to what most people do, how am I doing like that? They all do. Uh, how am I doing? They're normally looking at the blade. Because that's what happens to most people. Yeah. Next one is locked elbow. If I use my, if my elbows locked, I have to use my body. I'm definitely not using my arm. And again, bracing is very important. And when you brace, you brace into your blade. Then I put it in and I push down and pull back. Push down and pull back. Lifting myself up, lifting the boat up. Lifting everything, up. using my body weight, for it. And my extra kilogram help when I'm pushing down on the weight. Okay. So again, bracing. Notice I'm bracing quite a lot. This, in this, this drill. There, driving, and again, short in by your toes, out by your knee. Next one, shoulder. It's quite a difficult one to do, but again, it's so simple. Rotate in, shoulder, brace back. Shoulder. Notice I'm looking at my shoulder in the, the outliers book. 10,000 hours. You can shorten the hours from 10,000 to 5,000 by just looking at the problem. The problem being, most people are looking at their paddle and they're not getting the shoulder. If you look at the shoulder, it'll work. Or most people do this. 
No, they actually look in the blade and they don't look at the shot. Okay. Next one is your core. Hard against your chest. Also, look, you look like a penguin, by the way, and it makes you unstable. But look what happens to my legs. They go automatically and I'm parallel. Okay, so you, this one you can't mess up. But even then, people go like, yeah, say, oh, let me see if I can do it. It's close enough to my chest, isn't it? Look at this. That's not parallel. Parallel there on your PFD, hard against it. And off we go. Next one is paddling at default. So elbows in, and all I do is watch my shaft. Look, I watch the shaft, watch my leg here. As opposed to the same people, they go, how am I doing? Saying, but this will happen. Parallel there, and I can watch it there and there. Next one, leg drive is the most important, but it's one of the hardest ones to get right. End of the day, we go forward and we drive this leg into this paddle blade. What should happen to our bum? It should actually go forward, but that's connected to my feet. Take my leg goes forward, I lock this in, and if I drive this, it has to go forward. So if my bum's going forward, what is it connected to? To your legs, to your feet. What is my feet connected to? The footrest. So that is how it pushes the boat forward. That's how you get your forward propulsion from your bum really forward. So so many people get the sore bum because they're pushing against the back of the cockpit, um, the back of the seat first and then pulling away, or well, they don't pull away, they just spend the whole time there and they get rubbed here and you get big sore sores here. What you're trying to do is even millimeters, pull a millimeter away and then push the foot against the foot dress and it'll catch up. Yeah. So that's what you're trying to do. And again, when you're con concentrating on one drill at a time, you can do it. But while you're paddling out there in the ocean and trying to worry about 3,000 things and say, worrying about if you're going to do your 10K uh, first time, you don't worry about your technique, you'll no way even be thinking about your legs. The more you do these drills, the more when you're paddling, the more you'll think about them in the race. So many people, so many people do the drills well and they come in a race, the first thing that goes out the window is what they learn, and they go back to default, which is bad. And they go slower. Okay, so leg drive. Barman coming out. He's a barman, man. Come on. Biscuits, raid your fridge. So, sing the last drills, extra drill. Pull to your knees, let go of the power, and just lift your hand. So it's there, power, let go of the power. If you keep the power going, this happens. If you take the power off, you can do this. As Ivan says, just your, your back of your hand. To your shoulder as opposed to a lot of people do this and they sometimes get sore wrists from doing it. Okay the last drill is putting it all together and if you put it all together it should happen naturally. Elbow to knee so let's have a look if it happens naturally. I rotate and look how it happened. Didn't have to think about it. In I go, rotate, in I go, rotate with elbow to knee. So elbow touches and I go in, elbow touches so now, we've just got all this ready and we think we've just done the flat water and then we go out at, uh, um, not Ambulant, what is this pass here, to Massa Pass and this is what happened to 95% of the people. No, 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 I'm not going to fall out. <laughs> <laughs> That's me this morning. I'm going to do the outside now. And this is how they paddle and they get blisters and everything else. Like, oh, no, I'm not going to do this again. Why do you think they end up paddling like that? What do you use for balance? Your core. Your core says, sorry, I'm not falling out here. They could be sharks. <laughs> so they go like this and their core is used for nothing else but balance. And this is how they end up. As you get better, you can maybe use the top half. And when you get really good, you can use everything. And when you're using everything, that's when you get the, your most efficient self. When your core is getting used to paddle and not to balance.
That's what leads me on to my next thing is that you should do all these drills in waist deep water. Because in waist deep water, most people can stand on their own two feet. And you get the feeling and the sensation. I'd rather have you doing these drills than spending all time on a, on a herb. Practicing the wrong technique. Because when I last checked, when I pull back on a erg, the wrong erg by the way, my boat doesn't go forward. And that's a different muscle and that's why they've all changed to the, the sliding ergs. We pull and the erg goes up. They've all changed. Because pulling a string back is not the same as putting a panel in and pulling yourself past. Two sets of different muscles. But if you want to use uh, cardio, it's fine for that. I'd rather do waist deep. And in Dubai, I know they're going to the best like nice shallow beaches. Just before you go out and paddle, practice all the drills in waist deep water and then perfect them in your boat. Waist deep, yeah, of the Okay, before I go to the boat setup, any questions on the forward stroke? Yeah. Much space to your play, um, the blades parallel to the yeah. chair. So the question is, uh, <coughs> the question is, how much space? Yeah, you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. So at the end of the day, what happens is basically it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tiredness thing. The further your paddle is out here, the more weight you carry here. The closer it is in here, the closer your arms are. So I've got paddlers that I actually rather see them paddle like this without stretching too far. And you'll notice with my technique, I'm not right out here. I'm yeah, just like a bicycle, never, never completely. I'm always there and there. So, and again, as you get tired, you bring it in. Because as you say, what happens if you bring it, shorten your paddle, you should be able to bring your, your paddle in closer and still keep the same technique. But I'm not going as far now because I'm a bit tired. Yeah. Can you ask me as you want. Um, Top hand, obviously you're not driving forward with the top yeah. hand, um, but pressure down the shaft. Yes, pressure down the shaft. The question is, is there pressure down the shaft? You'll find that a lot of the times it happens to me and it happens to a lot of other people, this happens many times. Because as I put, if I put this panel in correctly, like this, it wants to jump back out. You've heard of forces and this is a force pushing it back out. So you have to really push it in to keep it in. Okay, but the, if you don't have that problem, it means that you put the paddle in here and it actually wants to just go deeper when you're pushing it in. So when it's like this, you'll find you need a lot of push here. In fact, you'll notice that I've sanded my paddle because the one side had a, 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 a winding so that it was rough and the other side was smooth. So they weren't the same, so it's sliding down one side and sticking the other side. Because you're going to feel the power of this blade pushing against you a lot. Okay. Gardener, hey? If Ben Gardner travels like you, would he travel faster? Guaranteed. <laughs> that's why he's only got nine uh, Monaco. <laughs> he's younger. Different style, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah I know. No, okay. Understand, he's got a strange style, but he's got a lot of the, he's got a lot of the basics right. He's using it for and things like that. He's got a few, everybody's got a few errors. But again, you don't have to, that's what I'm saying, you don't have to have the same, you don't have to look like me. You don't have to look like Hank, but what you've got to do is have the basics. The basics are get the panel in early, which he does, use his core, which he does, and he's, he's probably a little bit, and he's lopsided, which is not so good. He's a bit lopsided, but at the end of the day, he's using the fundamentals, using your big muscles, using your core, getting your panel in early, and taking it out early. But it's hard to do it, and hard to do it efficiently. And don't worry, when you're coaching, you're doing many hours, You'll eventually work out which works for you and it's the more you're going to drop your arms because the more you do this, the more you get sore shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, you, you don't have to. Yeah. You, you have to push hard on this hand. But not on the hand, on the shoulder. So you're pushing this. Everything's your body. Exactly. It's like this as opposed to... This hand is basically, you want to make it extend of the shoulder. The same thing as gripping. People ask me about blisters. This is, this is a paddle grip. Okay, not this. And I see everybody like this. And when they like this, they get blisters and they get carpal tunnel. This is 
don't mention any names here. Powerful tunnels that have to have operations because of holding like this. Yeah. So it's holding like this. Pushing through like this. This. If I'm doing a bench press, and I don't want to ever do a bench press, but I'm just or bench push like this. It's like this. You can see how much force I'm pushing down on it. So when, when you're pushing down, yeah. you're actually thinking um, that top hand is opposing that opposite knee. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. And, and with your motion eyes, I don't know if you're still using it, but just for you, when you've got your, um, your sort of paddle length in the water, is it roughly 1.5? Yeah, yeah, I, I have it a little bit longer, and then I just I did a strain gauge as well, which is interesting. They had, uh, I had a strain gauge on my paddle two weeks ago in Michigan with a scientist that uh, put four strain gauges out to see how yeah, it was, that was really interesting. You see a normal paddle and then they said, because the, the normal paddle was like power up and power down. Like mine was like, curve. yeah, yeah, mine, mine wasn't. Mine was like a triangle rectangle. Power straight away, long power, and then off. So he, that, was, that was like a light bulb moment. They all dig it, say, oh no, it looks quite good. And then our paddle was, it was obviously a strange paddle, strange boat early in the morning. But still, mine was power immediately. Up, straight up power, power off. And that comes from there, power hard, and then straight off. We guys are still pulling too far back. And I get this curve, yeah. Like it actually is doing, which makes sense. Yeah. When you think about it, you. You've got that power going, this should be the same because you've, you've got your whole force of your, both sides of your body driving the paddle for that distance. It's a very, very useful tool that, you know? Yeah. Because if you're breaking at the hips and you're losing power, yeah. you see it in the belt that curve. You get should be, yeah, exactly. So it's like your top hand just comes up at the Yeah, I know, the same thing. Yeah. But I mean, I haven't perfected it yet, but it's quite a nice tool. He's, he's just getting it. The, 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 the gadget was about this big. That was like handmade. He's a scientist. Oh, no, they use it in Andorini. Yeah, no, no, the, the Vaka one or the Vaka one. I haven't used that one. But again, you have to use their paddle and you have to be inside. So he's developing it so you can put it onto your own paddle. That's a difficult thing. Okay, boat setup. Very simple. <coughs> Before we get in the water. Where do I have my knees? I don't know my leg distance from the foot rest. Normally everybody tells me they put a thumb under their knee or something like that. Is that right? That's definitely not right. Yeah, I did listen to you. So <laughs> the flat on the exactly. Ah, oh, hey, biscuit, you got one. You won yesterday. I did listen. You listen. Okay. So it's very simple. Get in any boat. Remember, every boat's different, so there's no way that this thing will ever work. You get in the boat, you rotate and touch the bottom of the boat on a full extension. Full extension. Touch the bottom of the boat. That is the perfect. Number one, if I'm at the bottom of the boat, my set of gravity is lowest as possible. Okay. <coughs> Number two, I'm exactly like a bicycle, just slightly off center. And you'll find if you do these drills well, the more you rotate, the more you'll bottom out, the shorter you have to make your, your foot. Okay. The next thing is your foot bar, your foot strap. Why was that developed? Uh, to help the rotation. So you could pull. Uh, Oh, it's only got waves. Rotation, no. Waves. 1930s when this boat was invented from rescues, when they're paddling out through the ocean, waves hit them, pop, over there, so hang on, and these put little straps on them. We, had little, we didn't have adjustable CS straps. That actually came late into sprinting, and in 1992 is a perfect example of the pros and cons of foot straps. There was a guy, Greg Barton, slightly uh, crippled, he basically fiberglassed his foot strap with his feet in with the foot straps to promote rotation and all this. And there was another guy from Australia called Kent Robinson, 19 years old, 18 years old. He had no foot strap. And why do you have no foot strap? Because it's useless. Because huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's clever. Oh, he's too stupid to realize he was clever. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple. It's basic Jesus. science. I don't care who you are, what Newton you followed, or what Einstein. If I pull back on this, that happens. Correct? 
that wasn't even magic, eh? Was that magic? That wasn't even magic. I actually just... If I pull back on this bar, this boat goes back. And that's the only force you have to worry about. Understand what happens in our boat, we've discussed it so many times, is that when I'm rotating, yes, my other leg's coming back, but I hate to tell you, we're moving our bum forward, and my bum's connected to two legs, not one. There, I go forward, so I'm pulling my bum forward, so both legs should be driving forward. One is only pushing harder than the other, that's the only difference. So don't pull back, it doesn't help, it actually hinders. Just drive harder this one and let the other one be a bit relaxed. It's funny, I had this guy from Denmark, top paddler, he's, and he's an engineer. He said, no, no, Oscar, that's rubbish. I said, don't believe me, trust it. After two days, hey, Oscar, you're right. Eh? I, I mean, so stupid, I constantly pull back. If somebody told me to pull back against my bar, it's gonna help, it doesn't help. Keep all the pressure going forward. Okay, your foot bar, your foot uh, plates also, also very important to be at this angle. Okay, your feet aren't shaped like this. So try and keep it this angle, because in fact, going down runs, like if, the, if you're going too fast and your foot uh, uh, pedals are too far back, when you push on it, it goes too quickly. So if you're feeling a bit twitchy when you're going fast, de desensitize your pedals. Just all you do is just let them go a little bit looser so you go down. Any more questions on that? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to get to a surf ski because it actually gets my coat to see how many people get in the surf ski badly. And I keep on teaching them and they keep on doing terrible ways of getting in. And there's only one right way. And again, everything I teach is so that it helps you in a worse situation. Okay, we all can get in like John Wayne, but you can't get in like John Wayne when the water's this deep or this deep or when you get past 50 or when you get a laugh check and oh, mention all of it. Okay, so I'm going to show you all the drills and I'll show you how to get in, I'm going to show you how to do rebounds, I'm going to show you a few excess, um, balance drills that come onto the edge of the swing pool. <laughs> Number one, it's very ladylike. <laughs> As opposed to what I see some of these people, this is exactly tell me about, right? <laughs> and you know I'm the wrong side of 50 to do this. Okay. <laughs> but what does this help you? How do you remount from here? You want to be all the time. Because I can tell you right now, that's why all these youngsters, they think they're clever. Now I want to do a remount like the John Wayne style. I can't get my leg over that tie, you know. Maybe at night, but not now. <laughs> so, how stupid is that? Where we practice like this, you get on and get off your boat every time like this. This is also where you end up when you remount. Okay, so this is something I really want you never get in like a John Wayne. The other reason I want you to learn to paddle around like this is again, some people got a big guts, but, and we're old, I can get to anything here and anything back here. When I'm like this, let me tell you, I don't care how old you are, it's quite difficult to get over there. And if you've got some of the hard boats, it's even harder and it doesn't look very lazy. And the same thing trying to get back here. Oh, well, let me get something back here. If you are always practicing like this, you'll become a master of re-entry, remounts, because you're always in this position. Okay, so never get on and off your boat John Wayne style. It's also much easier to get on. Okay, then the, the, one of the drills you'll see, and it's a very simple drill, for balance, you'll notice one thing I will really, if I'm teaching people, you must never have your paddle out the water. But let's go. So this is a, a drill that you just learned. It's very simple. But again, it's nothing to do with lifting my legs. Look where the power is coming. This is what most people do. Do my legs move? If I do this, look up, I've made it long. Because that's the power coming from my paddle stroke. Power from my stroke. It's hardly moving. My boat went forward, the paddle stayed in the one position place and I've flung my legs over. And you should be doing this every session as well as remount. And you can see how easy it becomes easy. Of course, like anything is a change. Why do you want to do that? Why would you want to do what? This and this. Yeah. It's called practice. Because if you can't remount on the right hand side, which most people can't do, this is a start to remounting on the right hand side. Okay. So now you're sitting here naturally, easily, you don't have to worry. Okay, 
day. So this is, again, it's a, it's a very good skill level. Because most people, when they do this, they go like this, or they do this. Oh, I, I did it. Oh, it's normally like this. Yeah. This is, again, teaching you how to, to dig your paddle in the water. You see I made it longer. And watch, watch where the paddle is, and let's see how far it moves back. Nearly zero. It's locked in. It's locked in, and yeah. So that's something that you should always practice. It'll help you with balance, and it'll help you with the power of using your your paddle to make you go forward. Okay. Okay. Just showing a few braces. Brace there. So understand when you're going. What you'll see the drills go hard. Paddle right. Turn right. Brace right. This is the brace. Very relaxed. Okay. Same on the other side. But so many, most of you guys paddle brace nice on this side. This is not a right hand brace. The boat has to be on the side, on to your side. Okay. Okay. The most important uh, brace that you must learn is the hello brace. There, there, and hello. Why would I want to do that? How do I get my juice if I'm paddling on? This is what most people do. And I saw them yesterday. No, it's there. Hello, brace. Have my paddle on the water at all times, and I will improve my surf ski paddling overnight. Same on this side. Either hold it this way or this way, but it's balancing all the time. I am stable all the time. And if I really were unstable, I even do it further out. Okay, so this is a normal brace, just doing that and that. And again, you can lean right over, it doesn't matter. Okay. Now we're going to go through the drills. First drill, just the one-handed catch, and, and, and I can be excused because I, I don't have to have my paddle on the wood. So the one-handed catch is just basically dropping it, as opposed to this. Let me see if I can get my paddle on. It can't get it in the water. It can't get it in the water. It makes a lot of noise. Okay, so from there, it's... See how simple it goes in the water as opposed to doing it. Okay, so now we're going to go the two-handed catch. So just rotate and in. Rotate and in. Notice it's not this, because this nothing happens yet. Eh? Not this. So from there, rotate and in. Okay, so now the first time we go forward, it's the catch and pull, you'll see This way will feel a lot bigger. They'll feel a lot bigger. Okay, now we get on the body parts. Top hand. Remember, you're always going to brace on. So look me locking it in there. There and driving. Look at my legs doing. This is not driving. And look at it leaning on it. Driving. Driving. And understand, I'm getting power. So I'm not using any pulling. I'm just using my shoulder to drive this paddle forward. Okay, I'm not using trying to pull, I'm just locking that in and driving as opposed to what most people do. They go like this and, and nothing moving. Okay, nothing moving. That's the most powerful one because 95% of people paddle like this and like this. Okay, so just locking that shoulder in and overdoing it you're going to get power. 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 Notice I'm always leaning onto the, and notice the brace strokes. We talked about the most important stroke. You can see in every one of my sessions is the most important stroke is getting used all the time. Next one is locked elbow. Locked elbow. What you're trying to do there? Number one, bracing, touching the boat, pulling short, short. Pushing down, pushing down. Notice how I'm leaning the boat into it both ways. You've got a bit of weight, why don't you use it? 
Those with a bit of extra use more. Okay, same thing. Always there. Touch the boat and in. And in. And in. And notice it's locked. And it's locked. And bracing all the time. Bracing. And very soft brace. Not gripping it. Okay. Very soft brace. Shoulder drill. Again, when you're doing this drill, if you want to do it, it takes a bit of time. You're struggling with it, just do there and feel that. Feel that. And then do it. There and there. And there. And there. Basically, you want to leave your hand behind and pull your shoulder back. working. You didn't have to think about it. Eh? I'm not thinking about anything. And I don't want anybody, in, don't, I don't want to see people lifting their heels up to make their legs work. You don't need to. But this will all happen automatically. It's called natural. Okay. Telling a default. Very simple. You all see. I watch that my shaft is parallel to my chest. leg drive so what I'm trying I'm going to over exaggerate what I told you earlier on what I'm trying to do leg drive rotate drive my body and like that that's how it, what should happen but as you see my bum is connected to my feet nothing's changed so when I, that happens and then I push the boat forward okay so what I'm trying to do is pull my bum off the seat push it into my footrest and then go with it together and it takes a lot of practice to get that timing right because basically it's there and driving and I'm trying to get my bum off. So I'm getting my bum off the seat, I'm moving this boat forward fast. Okay. Exit drill. <coughs> Same thing again, remember, let off the power at the right time. So it's there, there. Rotate, there. Notice how much splash I'm making for those people that splash me when I'm planning next to them. Zero. Because you can't actually give any splash if you're doing it that way. And I'll make I'll make a long run. This is elbow to knee and then I'll show you some rebound. Elbow to knee. So watch how it works. Should look effortless and it's the closest thing to how I actually paddle. Funny enough. thinking about it. If I do it right, you notice I didn't like, oh, worry about my knees there. Everything should happen automatically. And even the way I paddle is very close to that. The way I paddle is very close to that. The only difference is you'll have different versions. Like they all say there's one perfect golf swing. There's not. There's all different ways of doing the same thing. Okay, everything is the same thing. Use your body, use your big muscles, and make sure your paddle's buried. And make sure you do drills. Again, do you think uh, the top golfers in the world just play golf? They do practice, and we don't do that. None of us here do it. And I see it all the time. Okay, remount. A proper remount, just so you can finish with the remount, and you can ask me questions again. Same thing when I get off. By the way, if you want to real, this is when you really get old. If you want to get off, you do this trick here. You know, when you're really tired, you get off here, and you use this as a walking stick, you know, at my age. Look at that. Oh. See? You can't do that if you do it John Wayne style. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to do the reason why when we have a water start, I can actually jump on. So when you see in the drills, I always want you to do dry, these are, these are dry land starts. So this, if you're starting a race, I want you to start from here. Because I can 
tell you right now, if you do this with the John Wayne style, the only way to do this with the John Wayne style, if they have the pedal like this, and the waves are crashing into you, don't have to worry. So this is, this is still touching the bottom, so I'm just showing you how easy it is. I'm, I'm, I move forward and I just go, very simple. And then I do this on the other side. And you see, when, you, when I can touch the ground, it's fairly simple. But everything's the same. How we got in the boat, from shallow water, now fairly deep water. Watch your paddle on this side or the other side, just make sure it's out. Or always make sure it's ready. So this is still not a deep water remount. So it's again, same thing. Wrong side for me. And off we go and paddle. Notice I always paddle like this to yesterday. I saw a few people doing this. They jumped on and they did this. Your paddle is your balance. So from there, then get your paddle. Start paddling. Get your speed up. Put your paddle in. Don't put your legs in before you've got your paddle. Okay, now remount. What are the few? What is the most important part of a remount? What is something that if you don't do this, the chances of you remounting are zero to nothing. What is the most important part of a remount in wind? Let's say in wind. Huh? Into the Nose to the wind. You've got to be upstream of the wind. Be upstream of the wind. Yeah. wind okay, behind why? You. Why? Helps you onto the boat. Right Pushes you, push, push, huh? push you onto the boat. Pushes you onto the wind. Never. You're too fat to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the way to do that. Okay, so you got it right. The wind must always be on your back, but you better actually know the reasons. Otherwise, what are you doing? <laughs> That's it. No, but let me show you. It's a very simple explanation. This is called a sail. When it's in a thing. This is called a sail. And if the wind is pushing the sail along, it's going to pull me along like this. So I'm going to be parallel to the water's edge. What is water line? It's going to pull me away. So that's what I'm trying to do. I don't want to do a remount from underneath the boat. I want it to pull me away. So just think of a kickboard. Kickboard. And then there. Okay, so let's go take a step back. Okay, so that's the most important part. Is make sure the wind is at your back. I can tell you right now, 95% of people will not be able to remount if the wind's in front, because basically what happens is like this. I'm going away and I'm like this. Now I gotta pull myself up all the way and it's quite difficult. Okay. No, that doesn't work. Okay, no, it won't work. You have to have it behind you. Just have it behind you. It becomes very easy. Okay, a few things we've got to remember, and it's funny, simple thing. Make sure your paddle's ready to paddle. How many people get on, they did all the hard work and they get up, jeez, and back in again. Okay, so make sure hand and everything's right. Now, the very important part is this thumb. This thumb is very important. The thinner the boat, the more important the thumb. This thumb must always stay in the bucket to the last minute. Okay, so the thumb stays in here for the last minute, I'll show you why. Your elbow is at the deepest part of the bucket, why? Gravity, it's a lot of gravity and it positions you the right place. From here, it positions you the right place, so I'm here. Then I hold here in the same natural form, there and there, okay? And from there, from there, I go up picking. And again, I should be able to lie like this fairly comfortably. That's what you should, you should ride, try and get your boat. You can see my boat's nearly 100% uh, level. From there, I turn my hand around and then I just slide my body in. But how many people end up like this? How many people end up like this? You see, I can't get in. It's like, so that's why I see you leave your thumb in here for the, for the last minute. You push down in it. Notice my legs are out there and I push down it. I haven't put my legs in. And then I get my paddle blade and I do it. Okay, so I leave my thumb there as long as possible because that's going to push the side of the boat down if I'm in these narrow boats. Or if I'm struggling, if I didn't, if I didn't get over far enough. Because many people end up doing this. Okay, same thing again. Thumb in there, they end up doing this. They get up here and they're like this. <laughs> Like this, eh? yeah. and then they, then they, then they, then they want to get their paddle already. 
topic but I mean it's the, the most the basics of catching runs is to be understand that you must only look forward you must narrow your field of vision to where you're going okay smaller field of vision and um, always be 90 degrees to the to the waves 90 degrees no matter where you're going you must only be at 90 degrees to the wave once you're on the wave then you decide which way you're going or other way around you should know where you're going and you once you find the on the wave you go towards where you go. But you must know where you're going. In this race, you've got to look at the point and you must know all the time and keep that point at, of reference all the time. If you don't know where you're going, how can you catch the correct run to go in the correct way? So that's a very short and sweet one and a half hour lesson. Yeah. <laughs> now, it takes a little bit more than yeah, but I mean again it's hard to just do it in one what is gonna make you catch good runs and then be explosive and rest when you're going to catch a run and remember that there's always another wave behind the one that you just missed that you killed yourself to try and catch <laughs> and you flooded yourself and you thought that's the last wave I'm going to catch so always judge it especially for you guys judge judge that you are 100% guaranteed to catch a wave then get it and if you can't catch it stop early and, and gather yourself and then go hard again so when you're catching runs make sure that you're 100% chance of getting it and not 50-50, there's nothing like it. You 100% of the chance, go for it, and then catch it. And if you don't think you get it, stop early. A lot earlier than you think. Okay, but, okay, but that's a simple, oh, so what happens is probably what you're talking about is that when you're going down the wave and then you start turning left and you want to go right and you've got no rudder, correct? And you just end up going out this way. You eventually outrun, outrun uh, a run. So, so okay, so that, that okay, so okay, so basically, the next part of it is that you always want to be on the top of the wave. Okay, so the, the reason why you want to be on the top of the wave for a few reasons. If I'm on the top of the wave, all waves are shaped like this, and our boats are shaped like this. So if I'm on the top of the wave, I take my 5.6 meter surf ski and make it into a 3 meter surf ski. That's why it turns very easy. I don't even need a rudder. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to stay on the top so that I can use gravity when I want to go down the wave I can just go down number two I can see everything from the top and number three I've got much more control when I'm on the top of the wave and it also gives me opportunity to go and catch the next wave when I see the gap remember these are all seconds and seconds and seconds that you're waiting on top and then you get the opportunity then you let yourself down and on to the next wave but staying on the top takes a little bit of effort the most important thing is how to stay on the top is to start early and stop early. So start catching the run early and stop early so you stay right on top. The next thing is to break. You can do that by using a paddle, using an elbow, or turning your rudder left and right very fast. It will make the boat slow down. And you do like a surfer. You go left and right on these big waves like that, it's no problem, you're going to stay on top. So you want to do that as well. So you want to try and stay on top and then when the when the gap comes then you want to go through the gap but the most important thing is to actually know where you're going because that determines which run you want to catch in the, dire in the right direction and in these waves yeah same thing watch the waves coming from the left so you always your your field of focus should be basically about this run down here the reef is here and i only look just past the reef and only in the waves about a 35 45 degree angle from the left of that don't look at anything else so it gives you a little focus and you'll find rhythms there'll be rhythm and, and patterns in the in the waves so it makes it easier for you to pick up 
the rhythm and pattern, as opposed to going out to your quadrant all the time and oh no, where am I now? It's you keep your focus on it. So if you had a focus on going downwind, number one is technique, number two is where are you going, number three is where is my quadrant, you know? then also watch your GPS if you're going slowly and watch your opposition where they are. But don't focus on your opposition too much, otherwise you will take your concentration off the way that you're trying to get. But again, spider, um, we might do some, some of that stuff later. I'm sure we'll do it down. Maybe before the paddle tomorrow we can do something, half an hour. So this gives you more time. Any other questions? I asked your nose before your knees were quite high when you were in the boat. Do your, is the back of your knee, the bottom of your knee, point them out? Yeah, uh -huh. exactly, yeah. That has to be, you missed the first one. That's the, that's the way to, at the moment, when I rotate properly, they look hard, but I'm touching the bottom, and we've got the lowest, the lowest uh, sort of middle hump out of all boats, and it gives you a lot of leg drive. So that's that's how much my leg drive. If you look at a lot, a lot of videos, you can see this is how much. Actually, what you did, then, you twisted the hips. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. all part of that. Yeah, it's all part. You have to twist your hips. It's like anything. Uh, so many people get back trouble, and they say, "Oh no," and because, as I told you before, your 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 um, Core is there for balancing, so so many people do this. Like, this is natural, look, and everybody can do it. You must have your hips working with you. And just going through, you might as well show you, doing the, doing the exercise on, on wasting water, this is where you do it. Okay, two hand and catch there. Just so much easier to do here. Catch and pull, you just go there. In. I'd rather have you doing this than spending hours in the gym. This is like such a good, and again, as you get better at it, thank God. Okay, so as you get better at it, like this one here, if you do it properly, the elbow to, I mean, your top hand, you actually move forward. You can see how much power you get, and this is what you're doing in a boat. Okay, same thing here. Okay, so these are, what I'm saying is, these are the exercises you do. There, notice my hip movement. Look how easy it is here. All those exercises look easy for you when I was doing an approach, but believe me, they're not that easy the first time around. Shoulder exercise, from there. Notice I'm bracing all the time. This exercise is a classic. When people do this, can you do this? Yeah. You think, what the hell are they doing all this time? Because when you do this, it's so much power. You've got so much power, you think, how come I haven't got that in my foot? But I said, this is the same thing. What is the difference? And the same thing here. Depending at default, look at it. So maybe you can do it tomorrow before the paddle. We can all jump here and do something next to it. And now this is a classic one. If you do this properly, if you bend your... I bend my knee, lock this paddle in. And if I'm going forward, what is my boat doing? Okay, so it's not no rocket science in this, it's just pure natural. There, I bend my leg and I straighten my leg into the turtle. Okay, and then exit. See, there's no splash, but if I do this. And then elbow to knee, this is, this is the best exercise for this is my closest thing I get to yoga. Elbow to knee at waist deep. There and there. There and there. And you see, look at all the mistakes. This exercise, I do this, I can hardly pull the paddle back. I do this, watch out. And this is the telling factor. When I'm doing this, I can't even move it. But if I do this, this is holding a paddle too tight. Yeah. Okay. So how tight you hold the paddle? Okay, huh, that's a good question. In fact, I left out some here. I was, I was I was trying to test you guys. I've done my clinic ten times. <laughs> where do you hold the paddle? Oh, you mean where? Where? There. Yes. Right. Why? Remember, I told you everything is being taught. Yeah. Why do you hold it there? Hey. Huh? 
Don't believe me, understand. That's what I said. Don't believe me, understand what I'm saying. So you hold your paddle at 90 degrees. Why? Most people go nine. You know why? Because number one, it's one of the most natural things. Okay, look, it's natural. Your first pull up and your first bench press and your first push up, you get told at 90 degrees. But that's not the reason only. The most important reason is a lot of people in the sea kayak industry, they hold their shoulder width. Now watch what happens here. I'm gonna go to this white line, see where my paddle gets to. Look how simple it is. To the white line, notice how much my body's moving, huge amount, zero amount. Now I go to 90 degrees, I do the same thing. So, so what I have to do, it forces you to rotate to get to the same place. Okay, so holding it at 90 degrees forces you to rotate, so if you want to know. Okay, so holding about the paddle, your, your hands are claws, claws, like a claw, like this. This is how you hold a paddle. So you'll notice when I was paddling forward like that, there, that's how I can actually hold it there, and then claw. There, look at my hands, and claw. This paddle does its own thing, just like that. In fact, if you paddle properly, you can hold it like that. Now you won't be able to hold it like that if you do that catch. Not even I can hold it as hard as that. Ah, it doesn't work. But if I do this, this, and then pull, I can actually pull. I, I, I did a test and put the, the, the meter. And I could do nine kilometers an hour like that. Okay, I can. Because that's what it takes. Your hands are closed, they shouldn't get blisters. Having said that, I put too much wax on my paddle. Saturday, Sunday, I, I, got but I, mean, I got blisters the other day, in cold, I, it was cold, I did 80 kilometers, I got blisters, I couldn't believe it. And, and all I could explain was it was cold, I was cold hands. I, I was very, I'm always loose, and when I get a blister, and then I didn't have wax, but if I put too much wax, so the question is, why do you put wax on? Is that before a race like this, a lot of people say, good luck, and they've got sunscreen in your hands, <laughs> and you get the color and and then you get bigger blisters. Because now you're holding tight and now you get sore forearms because you're holding tight because the paddle's slipping in your hand. So if you put wax on it, but you must put a little bit of wax. The reason why I use wax and nothing else is that with wax, after 10 minutes it's gone. But if you put too much wax, after two hours it's still there and you've got blisters. Mm. Yeah, but you must just hold soft. So it really, oh, you really hold it like that. That's what I'm saying. When you're on a brace, brace like that. Look at my brace, if I'm doing this brace here. You don't need any power, no hand. So really keep it. And again, if you practice your brace all the time, like that, it's going to happen. Really well. When is that the problem? The problem is the problem. Bracing is the problem, believe me. If you got, if, so the blisters are caused by being nervous and holding on tight. I told you before. Right, no. The wave. Yeah, no, but you must wait for that one to go away. Wait, catch the next one where you can catch it. Because understand, if you quick tension up here, this tenses up, everything tenses up from the fall. I hate to tell you that happens. So if you brace easy and everything's thing, you will not get this. But if you call, you think, uh, and if you're paddling too hard, that's you know. Any more questions? Whatever left out. Uh, the angle of your do you know what the optimal angle is? You're not going to like this. And they'll answer it for you. Why? Why? Now he's going to ask you why. Can you explain? Zero. Zero. No, okay. So, just to some of you ask me what is the optimal angle of your paddle? No. So you haven't paddled before, no. zero. No. This is far more, this is far easier to do. You don't have to think about anything, then this. Oh, hold on. She was. Hold on. Okay, it's called the sheep mentality. Everybody just paddles 60 degrees right because somebody else told them to paddle 60 degrees. And the reason why you're paddling 60 degrees and not 90 degrees is because some sheep deviated and got to 60. Otherwise, it would be 90. No, the bottom line is feather angle is there for the wind. And there's things that I don't like is flat water and paddling into the wind. So I'd rather have zero I would have zero paddle. If I but don't change it now. 
But if you're having wrist problems, just make your angle go less and less and less. And if you're really good and you had have you and only just started, then you I would go zero. Yes, slowly. Just go slowly. Incremental like once every week. Go a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. And you'll and, and at zero you'll be far more happier. Because the reason why, so let me tell you another reason why the girls can explain why you want to be zero. Another reason why you want to be at zero. Watch this. I brace. Oh, and I'm like you, 60 right, this is you. Guarantee this is you. Oh. Correct? Hey? Is that correct? Yeah, unbelievably correct. But it's not. But people again, that's what happens when people just follow the crowd. And I stopped, I stopped doing that after the 92 Olympics. No, no, I remember I've been playing for 45 years. So I was at 90, now I'm at like 70, and I'm going to go all, I'm just going to, every time, every like year, I just come back for five years. There's no reason why I need to be. And I teach this way, and the reason why I teach this way is it's very simple. You get two novices and give one zero and one sixty, and the guy with zero is the champion within a week. The other guy's still trying to work out which angle and which side he has to handle it. Because that's not that. It's called being used to it. When you paddle 50,000 kilometers like I at, at, at 75 degrees or 80 degrees, you get used to it. You think that's the norm, but that's not the norm. And the most important thing for me in the Sersky planning is the brace. Because when you're at, six, at, at 60, this is what you like, and then you go this side, and out. Oh, you missed that part. Okay, so you missed the part. What about the length of your paddle? Some people could probably ask you. So tell me, have you got a bicycle? Have you got a bicycle? Yeah. Would you stay in the same gear going up the hill and down the hill? No. Why not? It's easier to change. So yeah, I, I know the change, but uh, so what is the, how do you know the optimal? Or is it just... How do you know what gear you're going to take change into going up a hill before you get to the hill? It depends how it feels. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's the exactly the same. same. Exactly the same. <laughs> Don't ever... Yeah. And again, what might have happened is that your paddle might have been too long. So when the paddle's longer, that, that it's, it's, it gives more force and more strain on your hand. What so again. And the blade size? How okay, so the blade size, so this is the difference. So you've got a bicycle, you've got the, yeah. this is the back cogs, yeah. and this is the front cogs. Very simple. You want to put a bigger blade, you're going to go shorter, smaller blade, longer. Okay. Got a paddle. My, my niece. My niece, she has to be a fan. You talked talk before about going down the wave and then shooting yeah. off to the left and you're losing your rudder. Okay, so there was a question. Going down a wave and, the, and as soon as you go down a the wave, then you're going left and you want to go right and you keep on turning and it just goes over the back and then you start all over again. Okay, so there's two things here. The only thing to do if you're too far gone is number one, Take your foot off the rudder. So understand you're pushing hard left and you want when well, you're pushing hard right, you're going left. So you're, going, so you're pushing hard right, what actually happens to your rudder? It cavitates. So it doesn't actually work. You might as well have nothing on the back. And if you take your foot both feet off for a split second, you'll get the laminar flow over there, and then apply pressure very gently. Very gently and you'll turn. Back. But let me tell you, and the best way to practice on a, on a speedboat wave, you'll see when you're like, oh, oh, no, oh, no. you just play around and you take the pressure off and then you apply it again and you'll turn. Okay, the way, also, when, you, when you're doing that, also try and lean back because you want to get the nose back out and then also try and put your brakes on because you want to go, because what's basically happened, you've gone too far down. You want to come back up so that your nose comes back up. But once your nose is out, People talk about leaning their boat to turn and all that, that's nonsense. <laughs> um, the only way to use is to use your paddle again. Okay? If you're going down a wave and I want to go right and, my, and I'm on top of the wave, all I do is pull hard on my left hand side and my nose will go around. It's much easier than leaning. I don't want leaning does, leaning, leaning. The only time you do lean is you lean, like I told you, into the brace. When I'm turning right, I lean right into the brace and I'm turning left because if I'm going 25 or 30 or 40 kilometers an hour and I lean the opposite way, I'm going to fall out. You want to lean into your 
your brakes. So, so on this way, on this way down, you're lucky for all your right feather paddles. Most of the time you're going to be bracing left, leaning left, turning left. Understand? So your waves coming from there, you're going to be bracing, leaning, turning left. And if it was the other way around, you know what you'd be doing? What are you doing? Swimming. No, no, you'd be leaning left and trying to brace right sometimes, like that. And trying to turn right, and it doesn't work. That's why some people do better on certain winds. And most people, if the winds came with the left-hand shoulder and your right feather, you are good. When it comes the other way, you're saying like, gee, it's a bit hard today. Because you should be bracing on your right-hand side. The wind comes over your right-hand shoulder, you should be bracing on your right-hand side. And leaning onto your right-hand side to turn up. Pleasure. <coughs> Pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, pulling out. Uh, of the, of the blade moving away from the boat. No. So actually, that was a good question. I mean, is there conscious? Is there conscious? And this is perfect to show you. Is there conscious sort of effort that you can feel that the blade goes away? Should actually like sort of help it. So basically, if I did this properly, let's have a look. This is how the, this wing blade should perform. I've got to put it in hard, and if I pull hard on it, it actually should go forward and out. So if I, if I do this, and look how it goes forward. There, it actually can go for It should go actually forward. So that's what you're trying to do. If you put this paddle in properly and pull on it, it actually wants to go forward like that. So that's what you're trying to do. Understand? You're trying to make this paddle go forward and then out. I want that paddle that much. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, because if that paddle's going forward, what am I doing? I'm also going forward. Okay, so that's what you're trying to do. Get it in, and if you do it, some tests like this, just like this, you can feel that it wants to go forward. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to do it anything, it's just going as I, as I pull it in. If I pull it in backwards, it's still going forward. I'm pulling it backwards, but it's going forward. So that's how you want it. That's that's the optimum. Get so that decides your blade size. You know? That's why a short uh, 200 meter paddle has got big blades and big long shaft because they're only sprinting. Okay. <laughs> Merci beaucoup.